Hi there guys, I'm out enjoying the tail end of some good weather and it's mid-September and the signs of autumn are all around us. The leaves are starting to turn and a lot of these trees and bushes are absolutely loaded with fruits and nuts, some of which are already ripe for the picking. In the hedgerows you'll find Gilda Rose and Gilda Rose is a really interesting berry. It can only be eaten when cooked and it makes a great substitute for cranberries. It can be identified by its distinct leaf and also the jewel-like clusters of berries that hang quite heavily on the branches. We've also got blackthorn, a very common one to find scattered all over the hedgerows. Blackthorn produces a nice bitter berry called a slow, or it's often referred to as a slow. And uh, it can be used to make slow gin. After the first frost, a chemical reaction takes place in the berry and changes it and makes it perfect for making slow gin. Although it can be picked early and it can be kind of artificially accelerated by putting them in the freezer if you do wish to make slow gin out of them. Another berry that's been picked for generations is the blackberry. And you'll find the blackberry in abundance, especially at this time of year, all over the British Isles. It's one that's been picked for generations and still picked to this day, which is great to see. There's over 400 different species of blackberry, and each varying the levels of fibre it can offer us, but nonetheless a brilliant edible, easy to identify. But that's really just the tip of the iceberg. There are many, many more nuts and berries and fruits out there that we can pick and process or even just eat straight off the tree. But there are some to be avoided, which we'll cover at the end of the video. Just have a look at a few ones you want to look out for that might be intermixed with those berry bushes that you're picking from. But we're going to have a look at making something today that's very easy to make out in the field. And that's a type of fruit leather. And we're going to be using a particular type of berry that really grows in abundance here in the British Isles. On my left hand side here I have some hawthorn bushes and hawthorn is probably one of the most common bushes that you'll find all throughout the British Isles and at this time of year it produces a berry, a very nutritious edible berry it can be eaten or we can take and process and make a very effective fruit leather out of it. The reason being is that hawthorn has a very high pectin content and pectin is basically a, a naturally occurring compound. You can buy it commercially these days because people use it to make jams and jellies with fruits that have a very low pectin content and what pectin does is it sets fruits into a jelly. If you've got blackberry, blackberry has a very low pectin content so you might need to add pectin to it to set it into a fruit leather. But there's an interesting thing you can do if you're out in the field and you want to utilise these things. Hawthorn having a very high pectin content, you can make a very effective fruit leather out of it, but you can also mix it with fruits that have a very low pectin content and benefit from both fruits as a fruit leather. And uh, you know, one will set the other and it gives you a better flavour and obviously more nutrition and you can get more sugar out of it. Hawthorn fruit leather is really easy to make and now is really the best time of year to go out and be making them. And we've got a couple of different species of hawthorn on my left hand side here. This one here is common hawthorn, Crotagus monogyna, which you'll have a look just there. It's got quite a distinct leaf with those typical wings at the base and a small berry, a very prickly bush as it goes in the name. And we've got one just back here, which is Midland hawthorn, which is Crotagus levigata, which produces a bigger berry and the leaf is slightly different. And what we'll do is we'll go into the identification of both because you can take either and make a fruit leather out of them but you want to make sure you get the ID of the hawthorn correct in the first place because there are a lot of poisonous berries out there and you don't really want to be picking those and making them into fruit leather or mashing your hands into them if especially if you've got cuts on your hands or anything like that. So let's have a look at the ID. At a glance, both bushes can look very similar. If it does have leaves, you'll see a distinct difference between them. Common hawthorn has deeply notched lobes, anywhere between five and seven lobes, depending on the shape of the leaf, really. And you'll see that the teeth only reside at the end of the lobe. If you look at Midland hawthorn, you'll see it's actually more of an arrow shape and it tapers back towards the stem. And it has teeth not just on the ends, but actually all around the lobe as well, and the lobes just aren't as deeply notched at all. But an easy way between them is just how Midland Hawthorn tapers back, whether it's common Hawthorn is actually coming out slightly like two wings just at the base of the actual leaf. 
If you're glancing at the berries from a distance, you won't really see much of a difference between them. But if you have a look up close, you can see that the berries from Midland Hawthorn are much bigger and they have a lot more meat on them. But again, you should really be able to identify it by the leaves themselves and the general appearance of the tree with all those traits combined. As I film this, I'm about three days to the end of September, so I'm almost at the end of the month. And the berries are at quite a good stage for making a fruit leather out of. And that's an important thing to note because pectin actually degrades as fruit ripens. So if you're taking fruit right at the end of its season when it started to discolour and really ripen and almost over ripen, the pectin quantity in the berries or the fruit you're using will actually be a lot lower than if you took the berry midway through its cycle. So if we look at these berries you can see they're quite soft and squidgy and that's absolutely perfect and the inside is nice and pale. They don't want to be too ripe or else they won't set properly as a jelly. There are a few techniques for gathering the berries in bulk. At the right time of year when they're really ripe you can come in with a basket and bash the bushes and the berries actually drop down. But at this time of year they're not really giving up their berries freely because they're not ready to drop yet. So you can just hand pick them which is what I quite like to do because I can be quite selective and in a really short space of time you'll have lots of berries, it really doesn't take that long. You can also run your hand down the bush like this but in that case you get a lot of leaves and you have to separate them out from the berries and it's not very good for the bush so I'm just going to hand pick them. Fifteen minutes and I've got almost a third of a dump pouch full of hawthorn berries which should be more than enough for what I'm about to do. And I don't really need to take any more, I've taken just a few from this bush here. Most of them have been from the common hawthorns that are dotted around here. But now I can make my way further into the woods and we'll start making some fruit leather. So I found a nice quiet spot in the woods and there's not too many flies around. You don't really want to be by a boggy water source where there's going to be loads of flies buzzing around all over the place. I'm quite far away from the water source and even though it's a bit damp it's a, a nice area with some good sun exposure. But I've got some kit laid out in front of me here and this is just the everyday kit that I carry with me when I'm out doing bushcraft or camping or practicing various skills. So I haven't brought any bowls or anything like that with me, no elaborate stuff because obviously the point is to be able to make this stuff when you're out on the trail. So I've got my dump pouch with my hawthorn berries in and I've probably got about four big handfuls of that so it's a third of the way full. I've got a nice mesh bag there and that's usually what I put trail mix in. I use bags like this to organise various food types so I have like one big bag with all my food in and lots of little bags like this just because those Ziploc bags can get a bit punctured and destroyed and this really helps strengthen them. But it has other uses as well. You know, it's useful down on the beach when you're putting seafood in and stuff and you want to keep it fresh um, in a river or a water source. And at the same time, brilliant for making fruit leathers out of, as you'll find out a bit later. So just a little sack there. I've got my guide bottle with clean water in, and we are going to need clean water for this. I've got my titanium mug as just a, a normal mug for mushing the, the berries up in, as you'll see in a moment. And I've got a titanium plate on me this time, but you don't necessarily need a plate like that. What we could actually do is just use this waterproof DD tarp pouch um, to lay the actual fruit leather out on when we've finished it, and then it will set into a jelly on this material here, because you don't really want anything absorbing too much moisture from it, or else it will have sort of adverse effects against your fruit leather. So this stuff here will be ideal. So first things first, we'll just take some berries. I don't take too many all at once. I generally just give them a once over, make sure there's no insects on them. In they go. Leaves you can pick out. And uh, just give them a double check. A few more of these. Okay. 
The leaves of hawthorn are edible, so don't worry if the leaves do go in. There we are, so we've got quite a few in there. You can see it's sort of two thirds full. Now what we're gonna do is just add a little bit of water, just a tiny bit. Just a little dash like that. I don't really do anything by measurements out here. It's all just in handfuls and splashes really. So we're gonna just start mashing that up. Now we can take our little bag there, start taking the hawthorn berries out, putting them in the bag. Make sure you get them all. There we go, in the hessian bag there, or net bag I should say. So now we can do up this little bag. Not that it's necessary really. Pick out a few of these little stems there, they're not obviously going to be a problem even if you eat them. We just start squeezing the bag like this. Taking off this sort of gloop like material there, this is really what we're, what we're looking for. You just want to mash up all those berries. It can be a bit tricky get it all off but just use your fingers get some more out if you sort of feel like it dries out then you can just keep going with it if you've got a strong mesh bag you can really give it some welly you know make sure that it's all out there and don't worry about the skin that's edible too so if that gets in there it's not really a problem it's just the pips I'm obviously trying to get rid of by using this mesh bag which just allows it to be a bit of an easier process but you can see we're getting there this is all drying out now get a bit more of it Put that to one side. So I've got most of it off my hands. Well, as much as I can get off really. If we open up this little bag here, what you should find is you'll be able to sort of turn it inside out and now it comes like a sort of dry pellet. It shouldn't really have too much moisture to it. Obviously there'll be a bit, but it'll hold together. And you can just obviously chuck that and uh, you know let, let mother nature sort of deal with it. So what we can do with this now is literally just spread it out. Don't have to use your hands, you can use a, a spoon, but since my hands are already decimated, I'm just gonna use those anyway. You want to spread it out quite thinly. We obviously got quite a lot here. That was only half the berries I picked. So I'll take the rest home and make more. It's all finished and this is ready to set and it'll take about five to ten minutes. I'm going to head down to the river which is flowing quite quickly today because it's been raining and wash all this kit here and wash my hands as well and come back up and it will probably set relatively soon but I don't want the flies touching it while I'm gone so I'm just going to put it inside this bag here I'll leave the bag open but just leave it like that and it will still set quite fine in there even though that's a waterproof bag now you might want to use a big mesh sack or create some other kind of barrier with the kit you've got it really doesn't take too much even next to a smoky fire, although if the wind changes direction, 
you might leave an opening for the flies. You just really want to create a barrier while you're not minding it if you do go away and do some things. So I'll be back momentarily. It's been about an hour since I pasted that hawthorn into this plate. And in that time, I've kept myself pretty busy. I've made myself a very basic drying rack out of some offcuts of hazel, nothing too complicated. And I've shrouded the outside of it in leaves. Some of them are old leaves I've found and others were just ones I've broken off and just placed around it. Because the wind's a bit choppy and I want the heat going straight up. I don't want it blowing all over the place because I've only got so much time today and it's just gonna slow me down if that's the case. I've also made myself a fire with some ash and hawthorn, some good hardwoods that will produce a nice bed of embers. And it is important to note that I haven't used any toxic woods like elder or any heavily resinous conifers that will affect the flavour of the fruit leather. Because in this process, what I'm trying to do, I'm not really attempting to heat anything up or cook anything. There are methods in the kitchen you can use in boiling jams and jellies because it draws out more pectin and allows it to set in a slightly different manner. But when you're outdoors, you don't really have that kind of equipment. So it's best to let this set on its own. It's been about an hour and it's almost ready. And then I can take it out of there and cut it into strips, put it on my little uh, rack there, and the heat will just roll past it and aid in dehydrating it into a jerky. So you don't want the flames touching the top of the rack, just good heat going past it and dehydrating it. And that's gonna be the next stage. But let's have a look at our jelly. If you prod the jelly with your finger, it should be quite firm and no residue should come off. You can see there that it's almost got a skin on it. And this is pasted quite thick and it's really darkened up in colour as well. I freed a little bit of it up with my fingers and you can see you can just peel it off like that and you should be able to pick it up. And it doesn't matter if it breaks because you're going to do that anyway to put it over the grill on the fire and dehydrate it. So we'll just spend some time getting this off the plate. You can see it tends to like to stick to titanium, which is something to bear in mind. And if you use a piece of tarp or waterproof material, you can actually get it off a little bit easier. But there we go, just take that piece off. That piece off there. Really does like to stick to this plate, I tell you. And there we go, and that piece is off there like that, and we'll forget about that a little bit. So we can actually take that now put it over the rack and it should dry. So we've got some really good heat coming off of the fire there. Plenty for dehydrating this. We'll just put that there. That little piece. Got some quite big bits here but it is very difficult to cut in half when you're outside like this. There we go. We'll just leave that there now for quite a period of time. And I'll stoke up the fire just a little bit to get a little bit more heat coming past this and maybe work on this shrouding just to get a better channel of air. So it's only been a short period of time and I've already had to turn it over and you can see that it's starting to dehydrate quite nicely. This piece here is a good bit. It's still very thick though, you want to probably make it a bit thinner than this on a piece of tarp if you're outdoors doing it. That way you can get it a bit thinner than not restricted to the size of the plate. But just a little trick you can do, the same as when you're cooking in the kitchen. Just put a lid on it, trap some of the heat, use it a bit more efficiently and it will speed up the process. It's been about one hour. Oh, that plate's very hot. And it's almost there. It's sort of really drying out now. Not burnt at all, not cooked, which is exactly what we're looking for. 
Still a bit flexible though. This stuff's quite thick as I mentioned before, so just give it another half an hour and I'm pretty sure it'll be done. So our fruit leather's been over the fire now for about an hour and a half. You can see there, it's pretty much done. Nice and flexible and dehydrated, not cracking at all, so uh, that would be okay to put in the pack. So we'll get this off the rack now. So you can see there that it's reduced drastically from what it was before, an entire titanium plate full of the stuff, and it shrunk down as it should. But that will last for a very, very long time, and I have some more in my pack that I'm going to add this to. And this stuff I've got here I produced at home. I've got a log burner at home and I've made a rack by it. And I can produce a lot of different kind of fruit leathers and put them all there to kind of set as the log burner's rolling because it gets cold at this time of year sometimes and it's nice to have it on. And you know, it saves me putting the oven on to make this kind of stuff which is, a, you know, you can use a lot of electricity and take quite a long time. Um, and it also, this is quite a resource burner as well. So if you are gonna make it, it might be best to do it at home. This is really just an example of what can be done outdoors and it can be done in a much more efficient way than this, but obviously it is possible to do it if you're out exploring the wilderness and you need to prepare some food and uh, you live in a part of the world that might be quite vast and you know, you're traveling for a great deal of time and you have berries like that, like crab apples with a high pectin content that can be made into a fruit leather. But if we have a look at this stuff here, I've got a variation in my hand. I've got some here that's made out of blackberry and this is really good if you get some hawthorn berries and blackberries I usually use two handfuls of hawthorn berries and one handful of blackberries mix them all together it takes a lot longer to set but it produces a much better flavor and it has a lot more sugar in it but let's try some of the stuff we made today I mean if you like hawthorn berries they remind me a lot of avocado and that's pretty good. It's actually got a bit of sweetness to it. A bit smoky as well. It's good. But I'll pop this back in the bag and get it in my pack. And that can stay in there for months. I don't need to refrigerate it. But I don't want to do the bag up. I want a bit of air just to circulate around. So I'm going to leave it open. But we talked earlier about hawthorn berries and we went over the ID and I said I'd mention some of the, the berries that you need to look out for. So let's go take a look at some of the, the dodgy ones in the bushes that you want to avoid. If you're ever out making fires, always make sure the ground's cool before you go. I've poured loads of water on this fire, got all the ashes, scattered them everywhere, made sure there's no possibilities of anything going wrong while I'm away. It's always nice to leave an area how you found it instead of leaving a massive scorch mark on the ground. But this ground's nice and cool now and in a few days it'll be like I've never been here. But let's go have a look at these other plants. So we're a fair distance from where we made our fruit leather and on the journey down here I found some of the most common poisonous berries that can be wrapped around and intermixed with those berry bushes that you might be foraging from. One of the most common ones you can find is Tamus communis, black briny. And black briny is a type of bindweed that will intermix with a lot of bushes that are out there. And you can see its fruit, they're very very bright and red in colour, a little egg shaped cluster of berries with a black pip at the end and often spotted occasionally with a black dot which kind of interrupts its smoothness. It has a very distinct and waxy leaf that's actually quite large and quite frequent on the plant itself. Um, but at this time of year the leaves are generally dried up and they're shriveled and you just see the berries themselves hanging on the vine. My advice would be if you see any red berries like this on a vine like that wrapped around branches to avoid them because there's another plant that almost looks exactly the same called white briny. And white briny has a very different leaf, has five lobes, it's quite distinct, unlike black briny, which has 
these kind of large heart-shaped leaves and uh, they're quite waxy but again the leaves for white briny aren't really there or present at this time of year either they're generally dried up just leaving the fruit behind and the berries look very similar to black briny uh, they're just slightly smaller the same color you know, very see-through almost and jewel-like like a, a sort of sugared cherry you know very very distinct and uh, you know, you'll see them in the bushes but my advice really would be to just avoid any berries that look like that if they're growing on a vine wrapped around a branch just don't bother with them at all there is another very interesting plant that you might find that behaves like a bindweed and it's in the nightshade family Solalum ducklamara or bittersweet and bittersweet can be found growing and wrapping around lots of different bushes in woodlands and on hedgerows it has a very distinct flower and the flower is purple and it almost has like a large yellow stamen coming out of the front at its core. Very distinct and you can't really miss it. Quite a beautiful flower. And the leaves are quite distinct also. You have sort of like a large dominant leaf with two smaller pinnate leaves just at its base before it connects to the stem. And the leaves are very frequent on the vine and present at this time of year with the berries. The berries themselves hang like a cluster, like an umbel that's turned upside down with weight due to the weight of the berries itself. And uh, the berries start off very, very pale green and they darken up a little bit, go to yellow and then they eventually turn red. And they're almost quite crystal-like and they uh, have a very bright red colour to them. Bittersweet is not deadly poisonous like black nightshade and deadly nightshade. It is often confused with both of those but it's a it's not as deadly. There are traces of poison in the berry and if you taste them they have a bittersweet taste. Although I'd, I'd advise against it because uh, you know obviously there are traces of poison in the berry and you don't really want to consume them. But those are just some of the berries that are out there that are poisonous and none of those really look like um, hawthorn but you know they possibly could be intermixed with hawthorn and if you're just stripping the bushes and taking berries off quite liberally you don't really want to catch one of those and turn it into a fruit leather because often dehydrating or drying various poisons can increase their potency in most cases and uh, it's not really a surprise you want in the woods when you're eating your fruit leather. But there are other ones as well like butcher's broom and yew, there's also the spindle bush, I have one just next to me here. All those berries look very different though and you'd be hard pressed to mix those up with hawthorn. So guys, I hope that video has helped out on just making a basic fruit leather. And this is just one way of doing it if you live in quite a hot country and you have berries like that available to you. You can always use the sunlight to dry them, which is a far more efficient and less resource burning method of doing it. Foraging is, is a great thing to do and I should really add that foraging isn't illegal provided it's not for commercial use. There are certain things that you can't really pick and areas that you don't really want to pick over such as triple SI, special sites of scientific interest where they don't allow you to pick anything. So do check the area where you're foraging. Most hedgerows will have hawthorn on and much like blackberries there's no qualms about picking them in this country as it's been done for generations. But if you are going to go out and do some foraging take some field guides with you and just make sure you're 100% about what you're picking and what you're using because you don't want to get it wrong. And there are lots of other poisonous and edible berries out there that you can research into and have a look into if you are interested. I also wanted to say a massive thank you to everybody out there for all the subscriptions and for all the comments on the videos. The channel's grown quite a bit and it's grown sort of beyond sort of what I'm able to kind of respond to on the comments front. It's got to a point where I just don't have time, you know, all the, all the time in the day to actually respond to comments because there's just so many of them. I do really appreciate the comments and I do read through them and I do sort of have a look at them and it's great to see people communicating with each other and asking lots of questions and uh, I really really appreciate it and um, also I get a lot of questions about the equipment I use and the gear that I've got I'll put some links in the description of the videos that I have so if you are interested you can always have a look at my website which has some stuff in the, the regulations and law section so if you're perhaps interested in slingshot hunting or knife carry or anything like that you know you can get some questions answered there but there are people out there in the comments section you'll be able to answer questions for you I'm sure but uh, a huge thank you to everybody and uh, appreciate you watching and hopefully I'll see you in the next video thanks again guys and take care